couple of things that I want to say that, first of all, if the ushers, there are some things at the back that I wanted to have handed out. We can hand that out while I'm doing some preliminaries. It says religion, religious liberty and human society on one side and on the other side, it's got a, a chart of accommodation, avoidance and acknowledgement. And we'll get to that either, to, either tonight or tomorrow, but I wanted to uh, let y'all have a chance to look at it. Um, I, Pastor, I just enjoy seeing all these women in dresses. Uh, you know, it's so nice. So, no slacks in church. <laughs> I, um, it's, it's refreshing, uh, very refreshing. And ladies, you look wonderful in your dresses and in your skirts. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about this conference and during the conference, I uh, was asked one time, somebody said, well, if you weren't a Baptist, what would you be? I said, I'd be ashamed of myself. <laughs> and there was uh, this, they went on this ecumenical fishing trip and they had a, a Catholic priest and a Presbyterian minister and a Methodist minister and a Baptist preacher. And they, the fish weren't biting, so they got into an argument about what denomination that the Lord would identify with when he comes back. Well, the Catholic priest said, well, there's no question he's going to identify with Mother Church. Well, the Presbyterian vigorously disagreed with that and said, no, 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 no. No, when you can saw all that John Calvin and John Knox did for the Christian faith, he, he's going to identify with the Reformed tradition. And the Methodists took exception to that. They said, no, when you consider all that John and Charles Wesley did for the Christian faith, our Lord's going to unite with the Methodist connection. Well, they turned to the Baptist and he looked genuinely, genuinely perplexed for a few moments. He said, well, boys, I don't think he's going to change. <laughs> now, now, it's a simple fact. If you took every church that's described in the New Testament and you drop them down in the middle of East Tennessee and you describe the church, they'd say, well, well, that's a Baptist church. Except the church at Corinth. And they said, it used to be a Baptist church, but it got kicked out of the association for speaking in tongues. <laughs> the New Testament pattern for a local church, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a baptized body of believers. And I don't mean they got sprinkled when they were babies. I mean, they were immersed after they made a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And they were baptized as an act of obedience and an act of testimony. And their baptism doesn't save them. It just makes them more obedient. Amen. And uh, it's a, we're a local assembly. By the New Testament speaks of the church 115 times in the New Testament. 111 times it's referring to a local assembly of believers. Four times it's referring to the church universal. A church which we will only see gathered together at the foot of the throne of God after the rapture. So um, I am delighted to be a Baptist. I don't, uh, I, I just thank God. Wonderful story about Charles Spurgeon. Now Charles Spurgeon got saved at a primitive Methodist chapel, which I've actually been to. It's hard to find. It took me about half an hour, but we found it in East London. And he was going to church and he got side, side stepped by a snowstorm. He couldn't get there. So he went into this little primitive Methodist chapel and even the Methodist preacher couldn't get there that Sunday. And so a cobbler got up and he was going to deliver the message. And he said, he, he said, the scripture passage said, look and live. And he said, you know, here I was worried about whether I was elect or not, or whether I could be saved or not. And, but this fellow was just saying, look and live. And he said, I looked at Jesus and I lived. Amen. And then he became a Baptist and he wrote to his mother, who was a congregational minister's daughter. And he wrote and he said, Mother, I have become a Baptist. And she wrote back and she said, Dear Charles, I've always prayed that you would become a Christian. I never prayed that you become a Baptist. <laughs> to which Charles dutifully replied, Mother, isn't that just like God? He always gives you more than that for which you ask. <laughs> now, take your Bibles and turn with me and we're going to do some some uh, foraging in scripture tonight. I want to go back and sort of review and do an overview about what we've learned so far, about the glorious heritage we have as Baptists and the unique contribution it's made to the United States. But we're going to start with Acts chapter 5. And um, 
the um, apostles were preaching. Then the high, we'll start with verse 17. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. And I'm sure your pastor shared this with you, but back when we were in seminary, we learned to keep the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. And um, they were the liberals. The Pharisees were the legalists. The Sadducees were the, were the liberals. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison for preaching the gospel. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and said, the prison truly found us, uh, found we shut up with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had them open, no one was found within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would, would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach uh, in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter, now this is uh, after, the, after Pentecost. So Peter has gone into, gone into a spiritual phone booth and put on a spiritual Superman suit. He's one of those new kind of men that never existed before Pentecost. Amen. He's got the bit between his teeth, brother, and he's not letting anything stand in his way. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged in a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. We ought to preach. We obey God rather than men. That's why government authority has never trusted Baptists. They've never trusted us because they know that in the end, they can't control us because our ultimate allegiance is not to the United States of America or to any government authority. Our ultimate allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who worship government, that drives them to rending their clothes and gnashing their teeth because they know they bumped up against an authority, they can't budge. They can't budge. In colonial Virginia, the Anglican authorities in the 10 years before the revolution, 10 years when as a result of the Great Awakening, Baptists were in the process of becoming the largest denomination in Virginia, which I'm sure gave a lot of heartburn to a lot of Episcopal priests over five, five, a little over 500 men were thrown in jail for, quote, disturbing the peace, end quote, which meant, which meant they were preaching without a license from the state. Now, you know, disturbing the peace isn't the worst definition of preaching I've ever heard. But, but they were not disturbing the peace in the sense that way. They were, they were just preaching without a license. And the, and the Baptist minister said, we don't need a license from the state to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a license from God. We have a command from God to do so. And we do. 
back when I was working for the Southern Baptist Convention, I went to one of those uh, Renaissance weekends. Uh, I was invited and, and, and some of the people told me I needed to go. So we, my wife and I went, it was weird. <laughs> but um, I got put on a panel and uh, now I'm not gonna name names because we're not supposed to name names at, at what happens at Renaissance, but to my immediate right was a supposedly evangelical leader. And next to him was an, uh, the assistant editor of a supposedly evangelical periodical. And on the other side of me was the um, uh, leader of a major mainline, i.e. sideline denomination. And next to him was a Catholic bishop. And <clears throat> near the end of the discussion about religion in America, a man had got up in the back who identified himself as a rabbi. And he said, now, he said, I know that you Christians believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, but do you have to, you know, uh, why? Well, the moderator who was smarter than your average moderator said, well, I guess before we decide who's gonna answer the question, we gotta say, who believes that? If you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, would you raise your hand? Mine was the only hand up. And so the moderator said, well, you know, you better answer it. And the others just about had a heart attack because they knew me. And I said, look, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a, I'm, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Um, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And his disciples understood that. Peter said, there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Say that of Christ. The apostle Paul said that there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, you know, that, that disturbed things a little. And the other guys were trying to, well, nah, 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 shut up. And so at the end, the rabbi and his wife came right up to me. They didn't want to talk to these other guys. They want to talk to me. And he said, okay, I understand you believe that, but do you have to say it? I said, yeah, I do. I said, in my faith, we have something called the Great Commission. And that tells me that I'm supposed to tell, tell people the truth. I said, if the price of respecting your religion is to disrespect mine, the price is too high. And I said, now look, let me explain something to you. If I get to heaven and I discover that somehow I misunderstood this, I'm not going to be upset. What haunts me is getting to the great white throne judgment and you and your wife, his wife was with him, you and your wife turned to me and said, why didn't you tell us before you get thrown into the lake of fire? And the rabbi's wife said, oh my God. And I said, yeah, right, exactly. If you really love people, you tell them the truth. If you love people, you tell them the truth. Evangelism is an act of love. Witnessing is an act of love, not an act of judgment. It's an act of love. Because we know the truth. And we know that it's either Jesus or eternal damnation. It's that simple. That stark. And I got to tell you, what I, want, what I want so fervently to have on my tombstone is, if, if the rapture doesn't come before I, I die, is what Paul said to the Ephesian elders. I'm innocent of the blood of all men because I did not hesitate to preach unto you the whole counsel of God. Amen. Now, brothers, sisters, you understand the clear implication of that statement. If we don't preach the whole counsel of God, we're not innocent of the blood of all men. That means our preaching or our lack thereof, our witnessing or our lack thereof has eternal significance for people. We may be the last witness somebody ever hears. And we must always be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. And we have done so. Um, the... Um, During the Reformation, Baptists were persecuted. 
from the beginning of the Reformation. The Lutherans persecuted Baptists. The Catholics persecuted Baptists. The Presbyterians persecuted Baptists. They all persecuted Baptists. Because they couldn't let go of that security blanket of the state church. They wanted the government on their side. And the government decided what they could do and what they couldn't do. Ehrlich Zwingli, he agreed with the Baptists in Zurich, but he said, I'm not going to go any faster than I can get the city council to go with me. <laughs> city council? How about God? How about the Holy Spirit? And in, in the Puritan Revolution, they persecuted Baptists in England. And they, 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 wanted, they wanted a state church. They just didn't want, didn't, want a, didn't want a king and didn't want bishops, but they wanted a state church. And the Baptists didn't want a state church. And the Baptists grew like topsy during the revolution. Because once government censorship was out of the way and people were free to share their faith, uh, it's hard to get that genie back in the bottle. And in America, you're going to hear about Obadiah Holmes. You know, in, in Massachusetts Bay, you know, they, they, they killed the Quakers. They hung the Quakers. They just beat the Baptists so badly that Obadiah Holmes had to sleep on his hands and knees for, on his elbows and his knees for four months because of the, the way it ripped open his back. They came for religious freedom for themselves. The Puritans came for religious freedom for themselves, not for anybody else. Do not kid yourself about that. But they weren't counting on the Baptists who refused to knuckle under. Roger Williams, you heard about Roger Williams today. He, he wrote a, a tract called The Bloody Tenet of Persecution. And then when they kept it up, he wrote another one entitled The Bloody Tenet of Persecution Made Yet More Bloody. And he laid it to the colonial authorities. He said the Church of England is not a true church. You shouldn't worship there. The church of England ministers were not true ministers. And by the way, we don't own the land because we didn't pay the Indians for it. And that really got him in trouble. Um, and the first government anywhere in the Western world for over a millennium where you were free to either worship on Sunday as you chose or stay home and shut peace on the front porch without being fearful of violating some Sabbath law. You were in command of what you did with your Sundays. Freedom of conscience, soul liberty, soul liberty. And finally, even though nine of the original 13 states had tax-supported state churches, which persecuted Baptists, finally, when it came time to ratify the Constitution, the Baptist view triumphed. One reason was there were too many of us. <laughs> Evangelism works. And there were so many of us that if we didn't vote to ratify the Constitution, it wasn't going to get ratified. And so they put in that First Amendment. Congress shall make no law affecting an establishment of religion, nor interfering with the free exercise thereof. And so the nine states that had tax-supported churches could keep them. But at the federal level, there was no test for office, no religious test for office, and no penalty for worshiping as you chose to worship. There wasn't going to be any U.S. national church. And gradually, the state churches withered away. And finally, the last ones were done away with. In 1832, mostly they were empty. Right, let, me, let me just say it again. The last thing you should ever want is government control of religion. Because when government sponsors religion, they get it wrong. They always get it wrong. It's like being hugged by a python. It squeezes all the life out of you and you fall over dead. Sometimes some people who are Baptists need to be reminded of this. I remember when the faith-based initiatives were coming down the pike. And uh, people who ought to know better. Um, who live in Lynchburg and live in Virginia Beach said, well, yeah, we ought to have the government, we ought to be able to get government money, but, but, but not, those, not those black Muslims. The last thing you ever want to do is let government decide what's a kosher faith and what's not a kosher faith. Because they, they may decide you're not kosher tomorrow. That's above their pay grade. There's no government official that has the ability to determine what's a true religion and what's not for the government. 
That's our individual decision. And we should never, ever, ever let government have the authority to say, well, that's an okay religion, but that's not an okay religion. That's way above any government's pay grade. And we should treat faiths equally. We should maximally accommodate people's right to express their faith according to the dictates of their own consciences, both in their churches and in the public square. We have a right. Now you see, there's a, there's a, there's a new idea that's afoot promoted by Hillary Clinton. Now you know that's a bad idea. When she gets off her broom and she starts promoting an idea, you know it's bad. It's called freedom of religion. And that means that the religion is free to be, you're free to have your religious faith in your church and in your home. But you can't bring it into the public square. That violates separation of church and state if you bring it outside your own house or outside your own religious assembly. That's not what our forefathers believed. And every, every major social evil in America that has been defeated was defeated because people of faith said that it was wrong and it needed to stop. Every major anti-slavery organization was started by Christians in the North and the South. And yes, there were anti-slavery associations in the South as well as the North. It was true of the slavery issue. It was the true, true, of, true of the desegregation issue. It was true of the child labor issue. All of these, women's right to vote, all of them. Let me just say this, a blanket statement. The plight of women has improved Everywhere that the gospel has gone. Amen. Everywhere that the gospel has gone, the plight of women has improved. I mean, in most places, they were property. They were the property of their parents, and then they became the property of their, of their husbands. And if, 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 a, if a person in the first century read the New Testament, one of the most shocking things about it was the prominent role played by women. Women were witnesses. Women, women actually played a role. You know, when, when, when the British went to India, they made sati illegal. They said, that's not, that's not the way you should treat women. You shouldn't burn widows on their husband's funeral pyre. And the Indians said, well, but this is, you know, this is our custom. And uh, one of the British generals, he said, we're going to put up a gallows at every funeral pyre. If you try to throw the wife on the funeral pyre, we're going to hang you. Because that's our, that's our, that's our, that's our, 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 that's our faith. That's our ritual. We hang people who try to burn women. And guess what? Sati ended. It ended. Everywhere that, everywhere that, that the gospel has gone, the plight of women have, has, has improved. The plight of the suffering, the plight of the poor has improved. Everywhere we've gone. Because we are, the gospel tells us that everyone is someone for whom Jesus died. And that makes them a person of incalculable value. God never created nobody. Now, we're, we're, a, we're in a great, great conflict in America. It's been going on for a while now. Some of us were listening when Barack Obama ran for president and Barack Obama said he wanted to remake America, not restore America, but remake America and make don't, no doubt about it. The people that have come in his wake, the social progressives, they want to remake America. They hate America. They think America's racist. They think it's, it's ignorant. They want to remake America and, and, they're, and they're denigrating and attacking our past and destroying our past and it's destroying our children's understanding of our past. And it's up to us to not let them get away with it. America's not a perfect country, but we're better than anybody else. Why do you think so many people want to come here? One survey said that 170 million people in Latin America want to come to the United States. Now, I don't blame them. If I lived in Latin America, I'd want to come to the United States too. But you know, at some point, if enough people come here, it begins to look like the country they left rather than the country they want to come to. 
We have a right to control our borders, not shut our borders off, but control them. But you know, the reason, why do people want to come here? Because of freedom. Because of freedom. And, and those of us who oppose this, we, we want to restore America, not remake America. We want to restore America. We want to restore it. That's a starting point. I had somebody ask me once, well, Dr. Land, if America, well, what would America look like if America was the way you wanted it to be? I said, well, that's a good question. I said, how about we start with America in 1955? That's just a good starting place. Now, America wasn't perfect. We had a big blind spot when it came to race. And we had a big blind spot when it came to the treatment of women. I mean, I look at some of those old sitcoms and I wince at the sexism. It's just awful. But boy, in 1955, most, most children had their father in the home. And, you know, domestic abuse, physical domestic abuse was way down compared to what it is now. And divorce was not near what it is now. And illegitimacy was not what it is now. And violence is not what it is now. And pornography is not what it is now. America was a much better place to live in 1955 than it is today. I said, I start with 1955, then I start working on the, on the racism and the sexism. I want to restore America to a place where we understand that our freedoms come from God, Amen. not from the U.S. government. All the government can do is recognize them and protect them. They are ours. They are our unalienable right. We have them because we're human beings. If we're a human being, we have the right to life, whether we're young and healthy or not. And make no mistake about it, you know, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, that shall you reap. There are lots of baby boomers who aborted their babies because they considered their babies to be too embarrassing, too expensive, too ill, or too inconvenient, who are going to be euthanized by their grandchildren because they're going to consider them too expensive, too embarrassing, too ill, or too inconvenient. You know, they're not productive anymore. It just costs a lot of money. Let's just give them some men orange juice. If we don't win this struggle for America's soul, there won't be old folks' homes. It'll just be termination centers. Don't think I'm kidding. There is that inexorable march of death, of the culture of death. It's gone from the womb to the nursing home to the intensive care unit, and now it's gone to the nursery. And where does it go next? Where does it go next? We have devalued and cheapened life. And, and when you do that, it's a, a society is a very dangerous place to be unless you're young and healthy and productive. And we have the added squeeze that we have inverted the social pyramid. The social welfare state, and it started with Franklin Roosevelt, is built upon an assumption that you have a population pyramid that looks like this. Lots of younger people and fewer older people. But when you abort 65 million babies, you turn it on its head. When social security was started in 1934, there were 12 people working for every one person on Social Security. Now it's two to one, it'll be one and a half to one in 10 years. Because a baby boomer turns 70 every 18 seconds. That's what happens when you have 78 million babies born in one generation. And you have a lot fewer born in the next two generations. We put ourselves in a box where there's gonna be a lot of pressure to limit health care to the elderly. One of the first things that happened when Obamacare went through is they, they rescinded the approval of a drug that had been tested and had been shown to extend the life of women who had stage four breast cancer by 22 months to 30 months. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna pay for it, it's too expensive. So those ladies are gonna die 22 to 30 months earlier than they would have. That's called rationing of health care. All that's coming unless we reassert gospel truths. And we are in a narrow window between when things are bad enough that we can see it 
And when they're so bad, then it just collapses of its own weight. We're in that narrow window where we can still, with God's help, do something about it. But that window's closing every day. Every day. And we have to exercise the religious freedom that we've been given. Now, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament. See what God told his people. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. They had a delay because of a lack of faith. But now they're getting ready to go into the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave to him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days. Thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. God says, choose life or death. Choose a pathway which leads to life or a pathway which leads to death and destruction. I don't think I have to belabor the point that more of our fellow countrymen have been choosing the path to death than life. A path of destruction. A path toward open paganism. Where we want to teach little boys and little girls that, that that sex is mutable. I mean, these are the people who are supposed to be scientific. Let me tell you a scientific fact. Every time a conception takes place, that baby either has two X chromosomes or they have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and that means they're either going to be a man or a woman the rest of their whole life. I don't care how many surgeries they have. I don't care how many hormones they take. They're either going to be a man or a woman. And this is the ultimate rebellion against God. God made them male and female. He created them in his image. Male and female he created them. And we're saying, no, wait a minute. I don't want to be a man. I want to be a woman. Or I haven't decided yet. I'm going to be on a sliding scale. I mean, th this is insanity. This is insanity. Just like when they say that a, a, a baby is not a baby. Before a woman knows she's pregnant, the baby's heart has already begun to beat. My soul. I don't know any women's bodies that have two hearts. I've heard about some that might not have any, but I've never heard of any that had two. <laughs> and I've never heard of, of uh, a woman's body that had male sex chromosomes. And 55% uh, of the babies that are conceived are male babies. That's, way, that's God's way of accounting for the fact that men in, engage in, in inherently more dangerous activity from infancy through senility. Which is true. Um, I mean, people get on, they're teaching this to our children. This is child abuse. This is emotional child abuse. And yet we let them get away with it. Why? I don't know. But we better quit. We better quit. Now, and we start where it always starts. Turn with me back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord, our, the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son 
all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee, promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord with thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. You know, one of the most, one of the most productive things you can ever do is memorize scripture. The Bible tells us, hide the word of God in your heart that you might not sin against me. I mean, wow. And I, I can tell you from personal experience, you memorize scripture and the Holy Spirit will call just the right scripture at just the right moment to get you right out of the mood when the devil's tempting you. I promise you. It's happened to me. Listen to what he says. And you shall teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when you sit in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not see if this sounds familiar great and goodly cities which we built not, houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt, by, shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods. Well, does that sound like America? I mean, you know, I think of, I, th I thought about myself. Now, my parents lived through the Depression. I did not. And they told me about it often enough. I can't really comprehend the Depression. 25% of male household leaders were out of work. And there wasn't any, any, any unemployment insurance. And banks were failing, and there wasn't any FDIC uh, insurance. They lost their money. People were openly talking about the collapse of our entire system of government. I can't imagine that as a baby boomer. You know, I mean, the, and it marked them. You know, Depression era, era people, they, you know, they save. I mean, they, they never have enough. They're going to save, they're going to save, they're going to save. There's got to be a rainy day coming. We boomers, we think, well, maybe it may be raining, but the sun's going to come out. Because it always has. We need to have family devotions. Amen. Now, husbands, I can't tell you how many times, I'm sure your pastors heard the same thing. When wives have come and said, you know, I could, I, I could just, I could put up with anything if my husband would just take the spiritual leadership in the home. You know, I could pick up the underwear and the socks he leaves, I, I, but I could, I could deal with all that. He would be, if he would just take the leadership in the home, be the spiritual leader of the home. We need to teach our children about God. As we're sitting down, as we're rising up, as we're going about our way, we need to have scripture verses in our houses. And talk about the scripture verses that are in our houses. Now, there was a, I know you'll find this hard to imagine, but there was a time when I was under severe criticism by lots of folks telling the truth so my wife got a scripture passage and put it in the smallest room of our house which I visited at least once a day and it said blessed are you when men shall persecute you and men shall revile you and say bad things about you for my name's sake for they persecuted me before you sort of puts it in perspective doesn't it at least they haven't crucified me yet it's got to begin in the home, Amen. in the home, and then in the church. We need to be teaching our children. And grandparents, you know, I don't see retirement anywhere in the Bible. I don't. 
Now, you know, my dad, he was a welder, and, and he needed to retire. When he retired, he was not physically able to do what he was doing any longer. But that just gave him more time to work in the church as a deacon, more time to, to help others. You know, if your children are too busy, if your children are not teaching your grandchildren the things they need to teach them, you teach them. You teach them about American history. You help subsidize making it possible for them to go to a Christian school. I will proudly tell you that the only time that any of my, well, my oldest daughter has a doctorate and my two younger children have, have master's degrees and the only time that any of my children went to a public school was when my, when my son was on a football scholarship at the University of Texas. That's it. The rest of the time they went to Christian schools. I want Christians teaching my kids. I want Christians teaching my kids without any government limitations on what they can teach my kids. I was sold after kindergarten. When kindergarten graduation came along, the children stood up together and recited a Bible memory verse for every letter of the alphabet. Yes. <laughs> I turned to my wife and said, well, that $5,000 was certainly worth it. And boy, I don't know who picked them, but they were good. You know, Honor thy father and thy mother, thy day shall be long. That was the H verse. Hey, that's an ace. We need to counteract what's being done to our children by getting them, first of all, getting them away from the exposure to public schools. The public schools are brainwashing them. They're, they're, they are, I mean, I'm talking, this 16, 19 project is everywhere, private schools and public schools. I mean, Christian schools need to be where you put them, not private schools, Christian schools. There's a difference. There's a difference. And we need to practice our faith or we're going to lose it there, there are dedicated people that are out to remake America. And they see the, 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 the pandemic. They say, this is our chance for a reset. Re, you know what they mean by reset? <laughs> they want to change America into a place we don't even recognize. Yeah. They want to put religion in its place. House broken. A nice little pet. They didn't count on people like John MacArthur. Governor of California. Twit that he is said, you know, either you quit doing what you're doing or we're going to find you, we'll throw you in jail. And John MacArthur said, you know, I've never had a jail ministry. Go ahead. I know this is a big surprise. Anybody who's heard John MacArthur, this is not a big surprise. He says, my biggest hero outside of Jesus is the Apostle Paul. No kidding. Folks, we need to stand up and practice our faith. Amen. And we can only do that when we're in the Lord. Can't do it in our own strength. We can do it in his strength. Remember, I, this, I, this morning I talked about Gideon. I, mean, I think, yeah, last night I talked about Gideon. I mean, Gideon was no hero. I mean, you know, he's skulking over by the, by the wine press trying to work out a little wheat for himself. And the angel of the Lord says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. <laughs> God was seen with the eye, Jesus was seen with the eye of faith. He was seeing what he could make of Gideon. And then when Gideon was obedient to the Lord, it, it, it says that the Lord put on Gideon. And literally, it's like the Holy, God's Holy Spirit put on Gideon like a glove. It was God's Holy Spirit on the inside. It was just Gideon, the glove on the outside. If we want to be God's man, or God's woman, in God's place, in God's time, with God's purpose, and God's power, he's told us how to do it right here. He told Ezra how to do it when he said, you need to. Ezra said, I've made it the determined goal of my life to know the word of God, to teach the word of God, and to do the word of God. You do that. You may get the settled goal of your life. And you'll be God's man or God's woman. On God's business. In God's time. Amen. With God's power and God's hand on you. And you'll know it. You'll know it when you're in the center of his will. You can, you'll feel his power. You'll feel his blessing. You'll feel his purpose and you will fear no man. Because our ultimate allegiance 
It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're in a time of great peril. But when I look at the Declaration of Independence and I see that we believe, we believe that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these, life. If you're a human being, you have the right to life. Whether you're productive or not whether you're healthy or not, whether you can take care of yourself or not. You have the right to life because you're a human being created in the image of God. And we ignore that truth at our peril because every time we deny someone else's dignity and worth, we deny our own. And life becomes cheaper and less respected and less honored. If it weren't for believers in America, I would say that we're doomed. But there are a lot of believers in America Amen. who need to recover their heritage, need to claim their heritage as believers, Amen. as Christians, and go forth as his servants and reclaim this land for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're due for a revival. The last one we had was 1858. And it probably saved us. Started out, by the way, 1857 was a terrible year. Had a depression that was worse than the 1929 depression. Probably the worst economic depression America's ever had was in 1857. And people were horrified by it. And people were openly talking about a civil war about the north and the south splitting apart. They were terrified there was going to be a war. And so the Baptist men of the First Baptist Church of Newark, of Newark New York, of Newark, New York, Newark, New Jersey, started holding a men's Bible, Bible study and prayer time at noon every day. And the Holy Spirit fell on that prayer meeting and it jumped the Hudson River into New York. And then from New York, it went all across the northern United States. In one year, between 1858 and 1859, a million people were added to the church rolls of the Protestant churches of the north. It elected Abraham Lincoln. If it hadn't been for those million people who'd been converted, Lincoln would not have won. Thank God he did. And then it went south. And during most of the Civil War, there was a continuous revival going on in the Army of Northern Virginia. It's been 170 years since we had the last great awakening. We're due. And when does it happen? You look back through the Bible, you look back through church history, it always starts with God's people getting right with God. It starts with a revival. You know, revival, you gotta be vibed before you can be revived. When God's people get right with God, lost people notice. We act differently toward each other and toward them. And they want to know what, what happened. And we get to tell them. And some of them start getting saved. If enough of them get saved, we have an awakening. And then if we apply the truth, the scripture to the evils of society, we have a reformation. And that's what we must have. I've been involved in public policy since 1976. I was involved in the pro-life issue before that. And the whole time I've known, the whole time I've known all we're doing is fighting a holding action. We're trying to minimize the damage until the revival and the awakening come. We're way beyond anything else. A mere reform won't do it. We got to have a heaven sent 24 karat revival that leads into a great awakening that culminates in a reformation. And once again, 
Let me say it again. It's got to begin somewhere. Why not here? It's got to begin sometime. Why not now? It's got to begin with someone. Why not you? Let's pray.